So good morning again, everybody. If, uh, if you are new with us, we're pumped that uh, you, we're honored that you took the time to come uh, and be here. And on your way out, if you want to, there's a little welcome center over there. And uh, just to say thanks, if, uh, we won't use your email for anything. Just know that. But if you'd like, we like to send just a little uh, thank you to anybody that's here. Uh, for the first time, it's a little Starbucks gift card. And uh, if you scan that QR code back there, we'll send that to you this week. Um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Joe. I'm the lead pastor here at Shift Church, and um, uh, we're kicking off uh, what we're ca uh, called uh, Taboo, a series of, of conversations uh, about some topics that, um, that the church uh, sh needs to be talking about, things that we're dealing with uh, every day. Um, and I, I think most of you guys know me and know that, uh, and if you don't, you're getting ready to, uh, know that I have, uh, I guess the easiest way to, to say it is that I, I have a love-hate relationship with the church. Uh, I love the church deeply, all right? Uh, and I mean that. I, I love the church deeply. I, I, I have spent almost my entire life in this. Uh, we have centered our adult life around the church, I, and I believe that the local church is the answer for the brokenness that we find in culture. The flip side of that coin is that I hate much of what the church has and continues to be in the United States. Uh, when, when we see historic and systematic racism within the church, when we see things like the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny used by the historical church for genocide, uh, systems of oppression versus systems of freedom, things that, that, uh, that produce harm instead of healing, those are the things uh, that I hate. And I haven't been quiet about this struggle. Like, you guys know this, right? Because walking through this season, um, and even just a few years ago, uh, and, and I think I've mentioned this before, that my wife and I really struggled with whether we wanted to continue to be a part of the church or not. Um, and when I, when I say struggle, it was months. It was a horrible season. Um, and not because of shift. Shift is the, the thing that actually kept us in the game. Um, but if I could describe it, it was like, it was like there was, it was a season, it was like a picture of barren field, all right? And that field was our field, okay? And then off in the distance, some, some, some miles away, still being able to be seen, a storm was brewing. Now, the storm wasn't something that uh, was, you know, like, we're from the Midwest, so when we saw storms brewing, it was like, hit the basement, you know what I mean? Like, this was the kind of storm that it was a summer storm that you would go out and kick, kick the rain in. You know what I mean? And what that storm produced in our hearts during that time was a thing that caused us to say, nope, we're not running. We're not giving up on this thing. As a matter of fact, we're going to reclaim what this means, and we're going to continue to push and be the change uh, that, we wanted, that we wanted to see. And so uh, we resolved during that time period uh, that shift was – is and will continue to be a church for the rest of us. But what does that even mean? Like, we say that all the time, right? But what does that even mean? Um, you're getting ready to know me just a little bit more. As a kid, as a child, I grew up in a small, conservative, very fundamentalist church, all right? And the pastor at that church, when he spoke, it was as if it was coming from the mouth of God, right? And so he spoke with great authority. So what he said went. That's just how it was, right? Um, and what he would do is he would, take, he would take these verses and he would pull them out of the story that they were supposed to be in, and then he would apply them broadly to things that were happening in today's culture. Well, not today's culture, but you know what I mean, like 30 years ago culture, right? And then, and then like as if whoever was writing that thing, these ancient words, were supposed to mean exactly what he was saying in 19-whatever it was. Yes, I'm dating myself. It was the late 1900s, kids. All right? <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> the, <laughs> right? Oh. <sighs> the, the very real problem with that, the very real problem with that is that if somebody's standing here on a stage like this and telling you that what I say is absolute authority, it's nothing more than a cult. That's the problem, right? 
And if, if that's the thing, and I'm taking these things from here and applying them to here, then that's what you have to believe. And, and it happens all the time. Take one of the most misquoted and uh, misused verses of all time. It's Jeremiah 29, uh, verse 11, all right? And this is what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The thing is, is that he's not talking to you. He's not talking to us. God is talking through his spokesperson or prophet Jeremiah during a time period where the Israelites had just been conquered. The Babylonian Empire had marched in and destroyed the, the Israelites, right? They killed and tore their families apart. They, they marched all over the place. And then they pulled the Israelites out and, and were and leading them into captivity, they were an enslaved people, and so God is talking through his prophet Jeremiah and talking to them, reassuring them that he hasn't abandoned them, all right? And that's just one example. There are far more dangerous and toxic theologies that come out of taking something out of context and putting it into days and, and making it say things that it wasn't, it wasn't meant to say. So... To be a church for the rest of us means this, that we won't twist scripture to just fit our needs. When we teach things, they're going to be taught in the context of when they were said, who they were said to, and why they were said to them. And then we can look at the broader themes of those things, and there are going to be times where there will be stuff that does directly apply to a situation, right? I mean, that's the reality, but so much does not. And so we're going to look at these broader themes, and here's what happens when you don't follow this, all right, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to teach you that God has plans for you not to harm you and, and to prosper you. But what happens when you believe that wholeheartedly, like, no, he's talking to me, and then harm comes? Are you telling me that my mother's eight-year battle with an incurable blood cancer is to prosper her? Are you going to argue that with me? What happens when that phone call comes and you believe that God's plan for you is to not do harm and to only prosper you? When we take, when we take these verses out of context, right, and apply them to things that they aren't meant to, that's called bad theology. And at its best, bad theology creates toxic beliefs and actions. And at its worst, bad theology kills and so to be a church for the rest of us means that we won't twist that scripture just to fit our needs. Now, when uh, my wife and I have been in uh, local church ministry for 20 years now, 20 years now, and uh, the, the second church that we, that we served at was, was up in St. Louis. And we, when we came into that church, it was on the tail end of this building campaign. Like they had, um, they had been in a, a, in a smaller facility and had experienced some growth. There was a lot of growth in the area, just people moving in, a uh, suburb of, of St. Louis. And uh, so we got there just as they were getting ready to finish this new facility. They had exper experienced so much growth that they built this like three point something million dollar facility. Now, I, I'll be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't fancy. It was really nice, but it wasn't anything fancy. It's just land, right? Um, but we came in the tail end of that, and it was a super exciting season, much like kind of the one that we're in, kind of, you know, in a new space and all the stuff that comes with it. And uh, I'll never forget the first week that it was open. Uh, I was the, I, I led the students there, and our student room wasn't completely finished. So we met in the multipurpose room. It was a big gymnasium, right? Nice, nice carpet with the, the all the basketball stuff marked out, and we had a nice basketball you could move them back and forth and stuff it was awesome so we we met down there and, and so we started playing basketball right and then <laughs> out of left field one of the church's karens and there were so if your name's karen i'm sorry there were so many of them as a matter of fact there were so many of them that my wife and i dubbed them the jedi council so uh <laughs> so if you're watching this from there you just know that you were pro no i'm kidding so she came out of left field and started yelling at me, and I'm like, what, what's going on here? She took the basketball. How dare you play basketball in this church? And I'm like, wait a second. We're in the gym. 
with the basketball markings that have the basketball hoops. But she was afraid that we were going to scuff the walls of the, of the new place. And uh, I, I, uh, we, we, she, she took it. She didn't, I didn't get to play basketball with the kids until like later. It was just, it was, it was sad. We cried. And the kids didn't love Jesus anymore. So that's her fault. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. Totally kidding. <laughs> but what happened was is that everything began to be building centric. Everything began to happen on the church campus, and that's what it was. It was a campus. Like, we went from being driven by mission to being driven by money, right? And the, 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 the rallying cry was invite, 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 because if more people came, then more people could give. And, 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 we, the, and show up was, was, was the thing, right? Show up. Even during, and I'm not, I'm not playing, I'm not exaggerating this, even during, and you've seen what's going on up there now, or maybe you haven't, but they got a couple feet of snow. Even during weekends like that where there were winter storms where everybody should have stayed home, we didn't. Because ha people had to be there. Because if people weren't there, then nobody gave. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, maybe they just wanted to gather. Mm, I was in the leadership meetings. I brought receipts. I know what the conversations were like. Everything became about that place. Now, I, I'm going to tell you this, that, yes, this place is awesome, but we will never be building-centric. The moment that what we're doing becomes about this space or another space, I promise you, standing here, I quit. I'll, I'll quit. The moment that everything becomes centered on a physical location, I'm done. I'm out. Yes. <laughs> Mic drop. The church is not about its space. Like, we are launched from this space into a city that deeply needs to be shown, not told, but shown how much God loves them, right? So being a church for the rest of us means that we don't exist for a building. We exist for them. So one of the things that, that strikes me is that Jesus said that his kingdom— was for those on the outside looking in, right? Like he literally started out his public ministry by saying in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that idea of poor in spirit basically means for those people that are on the end of the rope. Like this is for you. Like you don't have to get it together to be part of this. As a matter of fact, people who have it together are often actually the ones on the outside looking in, and this is for you, right? He compared this thing to a mustard seed planted by a farmer. Context of that is the mustard plant was an invasive species that no, that no respected farmer would ever plant. He also compared it to, to bread baked with yeast. And yeast is historically, in the Jewish culture, looked upon, especially in the Old Testament, looked upon as bad. So he compared it to those things. And then, and then we see in, in, in Luke's account of, of Jesus' life, we see that Jesus is comparing, he's telling these a uh, series of stories, and in one of the stories, he talks about a, a shepherd who lost a sheep, right? And what does he do? He doesn't, he doesn't discount that one sheep. He leaves the 99, right? He goes and finds the one, and then what does he do when the shepherd finds the one? Like he hauls it up over him, brings it back, and they celebrate. They throw a huge party, right? And we can see that here in Luke 15, verse 7. It says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't. If we just sit here amongst ourselves and pat ourselves on the back and say, yay, we did it, then we should be ashamed of ourselves. Should we celebrate this? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we should take time to reflect on all of the things that led to this, right? We should absolutely do that. Uh, but this isn't it. This cannot become our identity. It's not the church. You're not going to church. You're going to a building. And our Life360 app, it's actually labeled the building, okay? Because it's just a space. Will we utilize this space for us? Absolutely we will, all right? Will that ever be the focus? Not as long as I'm the pastor. Not as long as I'm standing up here. I want this space to be for others. We should hold this space open-handed. Like, we're never going to charge for this space. If we have a community partner that wants to use this space and they need somebody to work back there, they can rent their time, but they're not going to pay us 
Brad and I, the whole time, the whole time shift is in existence. We've always been aligned in that. Like, that's just how it's going to, we're going to hold it open-handedly. Because this place is not about us. Being a church for the rest of us means that we don't exist for this space, right? Like, we want to utilize this space, and we exist for them, right? Now, you're going to get to know a little bit more about me. I grew up in the church. I, I was, I've said it before, I don't know if any of you guys remember bus ministries, when they used to take big buses around neighborhoods and load the kids up and take them to the church. That was me. Okay, I did that. Uh, so I, I literally, some of my earliest memories are, are, are part of the church. And then, uh, having worked in the church, local church, for 20 years, you start to notice some things. There are things about church people that are weird, right? That's just, I mean, we got to own it. Like, we have, we say certain things, and we do certain things, and anybody outside of that hasn't been a part of the church, they see that, that uh, Christianese, and they're like, what, what are we doing? You know what I mean? That's just how it is. One of the things that I, I have noticed about the church growing up and, and then working in it is that uh, we love to meet, okay? And then w- when we meet, we love to eat, okay? That makes sense, okay? Church people can throw down with some crock pots. Um, that's, <laughs> right? Like, that's fine. That makes sense to me. The one, one of them that did make sense to me is that, like, we love, church people love to do studies on every, there are so many studies. If you look up Bible studies, you will be there, Google will explode, there are so many studies. And then the thing is, you add, you add to that, that, like every time we meet, we have to do a study about this thing. And then if you follow Jesus, you have to be at this thing, this study about this thing. Because it is of the utmost importance. And so then all of a sudden we've got this like this. Well, here, take this. Taking a verse out of context and applying it to something that it's not really meaning to speak to. Hebrews. Uh, it's a, a letter in the, the, the. Oh, well, no, leave it there. Yes, you're right. I almost skipped one. No, no, no. You're good. I freaked her out. Don't mishear me. Gathering is important. All right. Gathering is important. All right. I'm not saying it's not important. Uh, should we gather together? Absolutely. Okay. I, I don't know how you do a thing apart from another group of people that are striving to do that thing. Right? W- whether it's a spiritual thing or it's a physical thing or whatever it is, if you ostracize yourself from the group of people that have the same goal that you do, it's so much, e- it's so much harder than if you were with them. Right? And we even see that Jesus made the gathering, a routine, all right? So it, here in Luke chapter 4, we see when he, being Jesus, when he comes to the village of Nazareth, which is his hometown, his boyhood home, he went, as usual, to the synagogue on the Sabbath, right? Like, that was part of his thing, right? So we see the, the good part of that, right? So, like, I want to, to actually to, to recognize that, but what we've done with this is that we've taken this idea, and we've stretched it to mean things that it doesn't, it's not supposed to mean, all right? And if we start taking these verses out of context, now we can go to that Hebrew passage. All right, this is a letter in the in the New Testament uh, that says this: "And let us not neglect meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near." The problem with this is that we have taken what what Jesus talks about, right, and we see Jesus doing, and then we create this system that not only doesn't help us accomplish that thing, but then creates a system that, that w- the system that creates uh, harm and shame and guilt. Because we've taken this thing and we've made it to mean like what? Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, uh, Wednesday night, prayer meetings, Tuesday night, whatever service, uh, Friday night, get together. Oh, and don't forget any of the other committee meetings and whatever else the church can come up with. And then use those things as a measuring stick for your spiritual life. Instead, I think that we should look to something more along the lines of like the early history uh, book of the, of the church called Acts, where we see this, this broader theme of what it means to actually be in community when we gather. It's in Acts chapter 2. It says this, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their possession or the property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. 
They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And so they had this system that fit within the rhythms of their culture, right? Now, if we took that and applied it to today, that doesn't work. Because our culture and the rhythms of our culture don't allow for that to happen. And yet, for some reason, we guilt people that we're not doing this. I mean, that's just the way it is. Should we gather? Absolutely. Right? Should it be a priority in our lives? Absolutely. Should it be the measuring stick? No. Not at all. Not at all. I, I'm not sure, like I said before, I'm not sure that, that to, to do the thing that we want to do, we can do that alone. I'm sure maybe there's somebody out there built that way. That's not me. Like, I need people. I need a team of people around me to do these types of things, right? But we can't continue to uphold a system that chews through families and then guilts them for when they're burnt out, right? So to be a church for the rest of us means that we don't exist for your attendance. We exist for community, right? And that looks different to different people during different seasons of life. Like, we're not going to shame families for taking the vacations or taking the weekend away. We're not going to guilt people for needing to step down or to, to take a break to rest. I, I have been thankful. It was a breath of fresh air when I stepped on staff, and it was always about people over positions. Like, that was a breath of fresh air for me, to be able to say, no, 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 we're, we're pulling out of this position. You have got to rest. And we care more about you than we do the position, right? And so we want to continue to build on that. We want to continue to build on that idea and create a culture that helps and doesn't harm, right? And we want to do it within the rhythms of the culture, overall culture that we live in today. And so one of the things that we're going to do going forward is that we are scheduling online-only services during certain periods of the year, all right? During high travel periods, vacation periods, there's going to be certain weekends that's going to be online only, all right? And here's our online only, our online only dates. March 27th, it's the end of the spring break. March 29th, July 3rd, September 4th, and November 27th. We want people to be able to gather together guilt-free because now you don't have to worry about, well, there's nobody there to serve. Well, that's fine because you can just watch it online, all right? We want people to be able to take those time away and not have to worry about responsibilities or, or, or even, even if the guilt's not coming from us, right? Like, you still feel that twinge. Like, I, I know how it goes. But we want people to be able to do that on their own and to spend time with friends and family because I can't think of anything better. I can't think of anything that honors God more than spending time with friends and family. Listen to me. I, li I told you, I grew up in the church, right? Worked in it for 20 years. As a kid, all the way, all those hundreds, good Lord, hundreds of sermons and lessons, thousands probably, I can't remember a single one. I don't remember one. I, and I really honestly thought if I could remember one. I remember words, inside jokes. But you know what I do remember? I do remember my dad teaching us how to properly field a grounder. I do remember my mom celebrating uh, our wins like she was insane. And if you know my mom, like my wife just laughed. Every day we talk on the phone, I'm so proud of you. She's still doing it. If she could, she would put this up on the refrigerator door. I remember being stupid with my brother. We have little recording, again, this dates me, but we had like a tape recorder, and we did all kinds of stupid stuff with that tape recorder. I can remember those things. I can remember all the family trips. And I can remember the family struggles, right? And do you know where my biggest spiritual impact came from? My family, right? It came from my family. And so we want to create an environment where people can have those things, volunteers and staff alike, to be able to do that, to have that just as part of our culture, that we're encouraging that. The thing that the church should be should be to come alongside the family and support them. Right. And so that's what we're going to continue to do. Like to be a church for the rest of us means that we don't exist for attendance. but We exist for community. And so we don't want to force it to manufacture it. Right. Now, here's the deal. 
I could continue. I could just keep going. Because there's so many things that it means. All right? There's so many things that it means. Uh, but I'm not going to because we'll be here till next week. And I know that we have other things to do. We have more important things to do. And so now comes the part where we leave. All right? Now comes the part where it's time for us to go because uh, being a church for the rest of us is about us at all. Right? First and foremost, we believe that it's about Jesus. Right? That he invited us to partner with him in bringing, in bringing healing and freedom to Gainesville, to bring wholeness to the city that we love, right? It's about partnering with him in, in restoring relationships, in accomplishing his vision of heaven on earth. That's what we do. And so a church for the rest of us means leaving. It means leaving this space, which is awesome, and today has been awesome, right? But it's not who we're called to be. And so this morning as we get ready to leave, we're going to take a moment to just reflect. And you notice there's these little cups on all of the seats. This is a pale comparison of what the actual first communion looked like. Like they, they shared a meal together. And we'll do that, but not today. And so in that little cup is a, a wafer-like substance thing. Well, just wait. If you take the communion, you know what I'm talking about. And that little piece is, is, is representing, it's, call, it's calling us to remember Jesus' broken body, right? And then that, that little bit of juice is calling us to remember uh, the blood that was shed, right? That sacrifice to end all sacrifices, that Jesus would willingly lay down his life at the instrument of the Roman Empire to show us a better way, right? To, to show us. He, he proclaimed, no, if you watch me, I'll fulfill all of this, which literally meant just watch me. I'll show you how to live this life. And so we pause to reflect on that, to remember that. But that's also an invitation to us, like individually and corporately. Like, will we partner with him in bringing that restoration to Gainesville? Will we partner with him to actually bring real, tangible health to this city? Right? And then we reflect on that just personally. Like, what am I doing to partner with him in that? And then, then the question is, what are we doing to partner with him in that? And so as Sam, as Sam plays, Sam and, and, and Peter just kind of quietly play. They're going to turn the lights down. When you're ready, if you would like to partake, go ahead and partake of, of communion. And then they're going to lead us in a song. And then we're going to go out there. And then we're actually going to live this out. And we're going to make the city better. And it's going to look different for different people, Right? And it's going to be small, and it's going to be huge ways, opening doors, <laughs> helping dismantle some system. I mean, it's just anything and everything. If you're bringing better to the city, then you're partnering with Jesus to do it. All right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for all of this. We thank you for um, being able to be a community like this where um, unity doesn't mean uniformity. And uh, where we can leave this place knowing that the things that we do through the week matter. And, and God, I pray that as we just pause to reflect uh, on your sacrifice, uh, God, I, first I want to say thank you. And second, I want to say please forgive me of the ways that I live out chaos versus order in your creation. Uh, forgive me for those places where I... I treat people less than they should be treated, where I communicate um, ill intent versus, you know, goodwill, all of those things. God, I pray that you would forgive me of those. And God, I pray that we would be a people known for uh, the week versus the one hour. And uh, Lord, I pray that when people hear about shift, um, it's because we have taken this sacrifice seriously and that we have made a difference in our community. So Jesus, all of this is for you, and we just thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen.